cases to serial killers, missing persons, and more. 100% he did this. I'd go off into fantasy world. How much more lucky can you get that you're not on death row? You want to know what we know? Of crime. Hello, everybody. As you just saw, it's Jay with Guilty of Crime. And today we're breaking down for you why Chad Doerman's confession was thrown out of court. And we're doing it with the legal jargon. Yes, legal jargon, everybody. I say that because I'm a big-time nerd, and I know a lot of you people probably are as well. So, I'm here to share the lawyer you know. He's one of my favorite channels, and uh, before I actually started doing any kind of YouTubing, I was on his channel nonstop listening to what he had to say. So, Let's see what happened here because I connected to a hard wire and now it's saying it doesn't like what I'm doing. So that shouldn't have happened. And if you guys can see me, let me know. That just totally uh, botched what I was doing. So luckily we're at the beginning of the show and what I can do here is reload my page. All right, I am back. Sorry about that. You know, I think it's the settings. I'm glad that you guys are here now. So I have Jackie, Carly, Sadie's mama, everybody. Thank you for being here. I have a totally new setup today. And uh, I think it's the StreamYard settings giving me problems. Can you all see me and hear me pretty well? Let me know. I'm good now. We were only two minutes in. You saw my intro. We're good to go. My background is scattered, but hey, I think you can see me well. I think everything's streaming nice, nicely, and I don't think that, um, I just think it wasn't the camera. So I got a new chair. Thank you, Carly. I got a whole new computer system here, whole new setup, and uh, yeah, so tomorrow or the next day, I should have a green screen behind me with a whole new background. Now, today, what we're here for is talking about Chad Doerman and why his confession was thrown out of court in the legal terms. We're talking legal jargon here. As I said earlier, the lawyer you know, I'm sure you can hear me fine. I talk loud, Jackie. Everybody probably has to lower their volume because I talk so loud. I could probably lower the mic, but then I feel like um, people can't hear me. So uh, let's see. Let me uh, lower it down a bit. Let the lawyer you know channel was a little bit lower so so anyway i like the legal jargon and yeah chad dober joe doberman chad doberman if i even said that again i need to make my words a little bit clearer my uh, moderator carly's letting me know chad doberman is um got thrown out of court his confession and i want to show you guys why because i'm a nerd and i, I should have been a lawyer or a police officer or something so that I could uh, do all of these things and um, have all the actual legal terms. But I don't. So I have my friends like this doing things like this. Check all right. This is the decision and entry on the defendant's motion. All right. So you just heard that. And this is what we're doing. I'm going to change the screen a little bit so you can see it better and so it's not so actually let me do it like this um you can listen to the lawyer you know break it down for you and uh he'll break it down for you exactly why and he's going to read in legal terms so there's a lot of lawyer channels but i particularly like this man he's amazing and uh we've talked before he emails you back he's a real lawyer he's great so let's listen to him and see what really happened in the court all right 
First thing we're going to review is the pertinent factual background. The defendant is to alleged is alleged to have killed his three young sons, seven, four, and three, on June 15, 2023. All were shot at their family home. Um, and then they give the location. He also seriously wounded another child and his wife. The defendant was apprehended at the scene and immediately taken into custody. He was secured in the backseat of, of a deputy sheriff's SUV cruiser that was parked alongside the road where he lived, some distance from the actual scene. He remained in the I'm hardwired, everybody. Not my, not my fault. This is uh, this cruiser for about 50 YouTube. minutes until he was transported from the scene to the sheriff's office. Um, a Claremont County grand jury returned a 21 count indictment against the defendant on June 22nd, 2023. He stands indicted on nine counts of aggravated murder, each coupled with three capital aggravating circumstances, eight counts of kidnapping and four counts of felonious assault. We broke that down. I think with my dad, um, if you guys want to check that out on the Doorman playlist, on our YouTube page for more of a deep dive into that factual background. But what gives rise to this motion to suppress these statements? Let's take a look. And like I said, we're going to be hopping around a little bit in this motion. The motion to suppress is directed only to statements made by the defendant after he was transported from the scene and initially interrogated at the Claremont County Sheriff's Office and then transferred to the county jail. There are essentially three instances of custodial statements obtained from the defendant, the motion to suppress challenges. And when you hear words like custodial statements, um, we're, we're going to discuss what that means as we kind of discuss Miranda in this deep dive. Yeah, so basically he's not going to go over the whole thing and we're not going to go over 36 pages of words that we don't know because we're not a um, we're not a lawyer. But it's going to help us. I'm trying to fix my lighting. This is so new right now. Um, so we're going to go over this and you're going to see the Miranda rights and actually what the statements were. So this is real facts here from a lawyer that's telling you the laws and what really happened rather than just, uh, you know, me telling you. The first instance is the custodial interrogation that took place in a small interview room at the sheriff's office on June 15, 2023. No doubt that is a custodial interview. He is there. He cannot leave. They are asking him questions that anyone would expect to elicit incriminating responses. That's kind of what it has to be in order for some of these rights to be triggered. But the second. Is the butcher interview that took place on June 16th in the defendant's jail cell after he was transferred from the sheriff's office. Ms. Butcher. Butcher is a mental health social worker. I'm plugged directly into the router, everybody. So I don't know if this is YouTube today. Anybody knows if it's StreamYard, but let's keep going. Worker employed by a private entity, Child Focus Inc. Her interview related to the potential mental health issues of the defendant at that time. Is that custodial? We'll talk about that more as we go through this. The third instance, the Griffin exam occurred on June 17th, two days after he was arrested, also in the defendant's cell. This third instance was initiated by the defendant as he was complaining of chest pains and requested medical attention. These statements were elicited solely in response to Nurse Griffin's questions related to his claims of chest pains. Whether or not you know you have a right to an attorney if you request emergency medical care in a jail cell. What are your rights and expectations of privacy in a jail cell? That's why the cop thought he was playing games All right. also. So first, the custodial interrogation. Like he raised five challenges. Number one, that Detective Ross failed to properly advise the defendant of his pre-custodial interrogation rights as enunciated by Miranda. A, and then number two, a valid waiver of the defendant's Miranda rights was not obtained because Mr. Doorman was never presented with, it, with a copy, sorry, with a written copy of his rights. Third, a valid waiver of the defendant's Miranda rights was not obtained as Mr. Doerman was never asked to sign a written waiver. Number go, four, everybody. the defendant unequivocally invited... I wanted to answer that question. I had to stop for a second because yesterday in the chat, everybody was saying that, oh, don't you have to sign a waiver when you 
after they read the rights, there's a piece of paper and you sign it. He just answered your question. That didn't happen. And it doesn't always happen. And it depends on the state that you're in. And yes, I'm a huge nerd and I love all these words and I know what's going on in the case. I just don't know the states. And I, again, not a lawyer. He is. So he just answered for you and all the other people that asked, don't you have to sign something? You do. But he didn't. And they never gave it to him. Invoked his right to counsel. Yet the custodial interrogation con continued thereafter unabated. And five, the detectives employed outrageous police conduct during the custodial interrogation to such an extent that the will of the defendant was overcome, thereby rendering any statements made during the custodial interrogation involuntary. So these are kind of five different reasons they feel the... Uh, defendant statements should be thrown out during this interview. Again, we're focusing on just the police custodial interview in the interrogation room, which was absolutely a custodial interview. The other two, maybe not. We'll talk about them later. So the court right away says Everybody these two about me? the written waiver and signing the written waiver. They're going to throw those. I hope you're all with me and you see exactly what happened and why it got thrown out. So all, all of these were the legal terms as to why the confession didn't matter. It was out immediately. They are without merit. The court reaffirmed the following well-settled principle of the of law regarding these claims. After reading the Miranda warnings, and they're they're referencing another case, detectives asked whether he understood. He nodded his head and continued to answer questions. TDS pointed out that he was not given a written copy, he did not sign a waiver, but there is no there it requirement is. that a waiver be written. There you now go. there's some arguments in case law that say it should be done that way, but it is absolutely not mandated here in Ohio. Okay, so they basically throw out claims two and three. So we're not really going to discuss the written waiver part. What we are going to discuss is whether he was properly advised, whether he requested or invoked his right to counsel, and then whether the police employed outrageous conduct. Was it outrageous? I think it kind of was. They hated that man. And they were cussing at him the whole time. And All right. So they also discussed like because of his mental condition, he was coerced or overpowered. And the court says there's no evidence before the court as to the defendant's mental condition during the custodial interrogation. Again, the defendant did not testify, nor did he present any other evidence to even suggest what his mental condition was at the time. The defense did not cross examine the interrogating defectives, detectives to ascertain their opinions of the defendant's mental condition during the process. Further, the defense does not elaborate or identify what evidence constitutes the totality of the circumstances relative to the above claim. A court is not required to scour the record for evidence to find support for a movement's argument. So they just basically say, not really um, an issue. We're not going to discuss necessarily his mental condition. But here are the claims raised to discuss the outrageous police conduct. There you go. We saw some of it. Chad Dorman was in jail, had no power, no agency in the situation. No one in his position would reasonably think otherwise. At least one CCSO officer threatened him prior to this. There you go. They said there outside you. the cruiser where Mr. Dorman was sitting loud enough to be heard. Is that the mother effer? Yeah. Shut the door so I don't effing kill him. That's what and a cop we, says we right outside the door of the cruiser yep. where Dorman was being held. We saw CCSO that. CCSO detectives that had previously ignored his request for counsel. Detectives used coercive tactics during the interrogation of June 15th, including Detective Ross comparing him to a monster. His mental yep. state was such that he could not make a knowing, intelligent, or voluntary consent to police being present. He had been asked, or sorry, had he been asked, he was in no condition to object to their presence. He was not informed of the recordings. And Bullshit. did not know the police were recording the conversation. The outrageous police conduct herein should not be countenanced. <laughs> you got so it. The court also just very quickly throws out the fact that uh, it was being recorded as some kind of issue. But we'll talk about some of these other things. Okay. Now, a lot of you probably know the lawyer you know. And um, his name is Peter Tragos. I call him Pete. Uh, when I talk to him, I can't call him Peter and take it seriously. So it's Pete to me. Uh, Pete Tragos, Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know. Let's keep listening to him break this down for us. So the court says that the defendant just basically makes conclusions 
Again, we have no um, evidence to support an issue with his mental state, number one. Number two, the statements that put him in the car or leave him in there so I don't effing kill him. Um, the court finds that there was no evidence that the defendant ever even heard these or that they affected him in any way. And number three, the comments about comparing him to a monster were so limited and insignificant throughout the two hours that he was questioned that there's really no evidence to um, say that the police were really outrageous in their conduct. Additionally, during this two plus hour interview, uh, Mr. Doerman, the defendant, was given water, Coca Cola, and dipping tobacco. And his Not hands, he was actually people. offered food and medication, but he declined. There his hands go. were cuffed in the back and they were loosened and moved to the front so he could drink and dip. And he even said and acknowledged that the officers were being kind to him in this interview. So basically, the court says no. No outrageous police conduct. But let's discuss. Was he advised of his Miranda rights fully and correctly? And did he invoke his right to counsel that was ignored? That's really what we need to focus on here. So first, on page nine, we're going to read Justice Ginsburg's explanation. I think he was actually treated a lot more fair than he even should have after executing three of his children in front of everybody, the neighbors, his wife, and having the police officers and EMS see all of that. So them calling him a motherfucker or a monster, really? You're going to, you just executed your three children and you're going to invoke your right. And they gave him tobacco, chewing tobacco, so he can get his nicotine fix, Coca-Cola. They offered him food. They tried to offer him medication, whatever he takes. Wow. What a society we live in, huh? Explanation of Miranda. To summarize, we hold that when an individual is taken into custody or otherwise deprived of his freedom by the authorities in any significant way and is subjected to questioning, the privilege against self, self incrimination is jeopardized. So he has to be taken into custody or deprived of his freedom. Procedural safeguards must be employed to protect the privilege. And unless other fully effective means are adopted to notify the person of his right to silence and to assure that the exercise of the right will be scrupulously honored. The following measures are required. So unless you just explain it in a verbose way that you take all the time in the world to check all the boxes, you have to do it this specific way. And you're seeing why most good officers have a card or something that they read off of because their summaries often fall short. I added that. That's not in her. That's actually true. You do see that when you see them go into the interrogation room, everybody, you'll see them pull out a little card and they make sure they say it word for word because if they go back on that video in court and they miss a word this can happen so that's why we're going through this plus i love this stuff and i want you all to know because there's so many cases that we're working on right now and everybody wants to know something right we all want to know what happened to elijah vu why didn't the police tell us that they found the blanket well maybe because the person that left the blanket if you tip them off they would have went and got it right or had somebody go get it so that they couldn't find it. So there's things that the cops have to do. And there's bad police work as well. I don't think this was bad police work under these circumstances. We heard them in the body cam calling him a motherfucker and a monster. And fuck you, dude. Get, up, get your ass up. Cussing. That's warranted. I'm sorry. I cuss at work. And I'm not a cop that just saw three kids executed. So... Let's keep going and hear why court works the way it does and why the laws are the way they are. For summary. He must be warned prior to any questioning, prior to any questioning, that he has the right to remain silent, that anything he says can be used against him in a court of law. He has the right to the presence of an attorney and that if he cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for him prior to questioning if he so desires. So why the fourth point? Well, if you just tell somebody you can get an attorney. Why is the internet doing that? If you want before questioning and they're thinking, I'm poor, I can't afford an attorney anyway, so why even ask for one? That's why you have to say number four so they know even if they can't afford an attorney, they can still get one. The opportunity to exercise these rights must be afforded to him throughout the interrogation. After such warnings have been given and such opportunity afforded to him, the individual may knowingly and intelligently waive these rights and agree to answer questions or make a statement. But unless and until such warnings and waiver are demonstrated by the 
prosecution at trial, no evidence obtained as a result of the interrogation can be used against him. That means we throw this stuff out if you violate the defendant's rights, which is absolutely how it should be. So people don't get railroaded right. when they don't understand what's going on or cops are trying to pull one over. We don't want that. Can you guys see what we're watching here? I, I hope that because I have my internet settings and, um, you know, I did this, I'm doing this early one here because I wanted to uh, make sure that later on I have it all set up and right. But I see uh, there was a lot of people and then they just, I don't know if they just got off work and they dropped off or what happened. But, uh, you know, I'm trying to really get this thing right. I'm hardwired in and it's really interesting that it shows me that I have one, um, that I have one bar. Very interesting. But I'm not in the, I'm not on the Wi-Fi. I'm connected to the Ethernet and uh, let's keep going. Then again, they review a ton of cases about how when they use the wrong word or they don't tell them a lawyer can be paid for for them if they can't afford them or if they just skip the first part or if they don't let them know that the words can be used against them or if they just say the right to remain silent but not that the words can be used against them. They go through all these little ways that show you what a stickler it is and how important it is to be exactly precise to get everything across to the defendant that's necessary. And as an example of that, we'll look at um, the way that the court sets out here are the four things that must be warned of prior to any questioning right here. There you go. One. This is important. He has the right to remain silent. Two. That anything he says can be used against him in the court of law. That three. He has the right to the presence of an attorney. And four. That if he cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed. All of the case law is clear. And that's what I was saying yesterday. I almost had that memorized and I'm not a cop, but they have to read it word for word or they get in trouble. So there you go. There are the four things. If you need to know, if you ever get arrested, make sure they say that to you or they're pretty much fucked and you pretty much get off on a technicality. So now we jump to this case. The ultimate questions here are whether the Miranda warnings read to Doerman on June 15th comply with the four invariable warnings required by Miranda, or if not, a rigid incantation of those warnings, were they a fully effective means adopted to fully notify him of his right to silence? So there are magic words. If you don't use the magic words, it's not automatically thrown out if you explain it in another way that still gets the point across. If not a rigid inc incantation of the Miranda warnings, did they touch all the bases required by Miranda or did the words used explicitly advise him of the full contours of each Miranda right, thereby communicating to him the same essential message? States Exhibit 4A records Detective Ross's re-entering the interview room with Doerman at approximately 38 minutes or 38 I hope you guys are still with me. I wanted to just share this with you and we don't have to go through the whole document, but I wanted you to see that was the first one. And that was the Miranda rights I told you yesterday. And then the second one he's getting into now. So that was in the interrogation when they did not invoke his right to a lawyer. And this guy's a lawyer. He knows you cannot do that. So look, this monster's still not going to get out of it. I don't think but, the, uh, but Pete thinks that um, he's definitely going to get convicted, but it's going to be a little more challenging. 12.38 a.m. He, I'll just call it 38 minutes so we can see how the progression. He brings with him a small black binder or folder and sets it on the desk. He then adjusts the handcuffs as noted above to loosen them. At 39.44, he tells Doorman he wants to talk to him about what happened today, but I got to read this to you real quick. All right. I read this to everyone, all right? And Detective Ross has in his hand the standard business card size Miranda warnings issued by the Claremont County Sheriff, the rights card, and it reads as follows. Here's how the card reads that the cops are supposed to read off of. Oral warnings to be given to a subject prior to interrogation. Before we ask you any questions, you must understand. And then they just read it verbatim. You have the right to remain silent. Here are the four points. Anything you say can be used against you in court. Number three, you have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions and to have a lawyer with you during questioning. Now, it's a little different than some of the case law 
But these are the spe specific issued Miranda warning cards, the rights cards that they should read. And number three is the important one. Then number four, if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed before or for you before any questioning, if you wish. Do you understand these rights? Are you willing to answer some questions? Mwah, that's it. Do your job, read it right. But that's not what happened here. So I'm going to leave them both on the screen at the same time so you can see. Here are the four points with these dash, dash marks that are written. We, we can't really see it so well, but you heard that. And so if any of you have ever been arrested or know somebody that has, or you're going to get arrested, which most people probably here that are watching, I've got a lot of uh, uh, people emailing me telling me they're in that 55 and plus group. And amen to you. I'm 44 and I'm working my way up there, y'all. So yeah, probably we're not going to go to jail anymore. Hopefully not. But now you know what they need to say. And as soon as I get off of this live, I'm calling Xfinity and upping my internet to the fastest that I can go. So I'm hardwired and I've done everything and I'm still having lag and it's pissing me off. So yes, please support this fan funded channel right now. Any contribution, how small is immensely appreciated. I'm not asking for any money, but letting you know that my setup is coming and it's going to be even better than ever soon. And on the literal rights cards. And on the recording, here is what Detective Roths advises Doerman of. Number one, you have the right to remain silent. We're good so far. Those match. Anything you say can be used against you in court. Anything you say can be used against you in court. But number three, you have the right to talk to a lawyer before we ask you any questions. You have the right to talk to a lawyer before we ask you. Sorry, that's not what it says. So he says, you have the right to talk to a lawyer before we ask you any questions. The card says, you have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions. See? And here's the important part. One to have a lawyer with you during questioning. There you go. One word, guys. That's Then just... if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you before. Any questioning, if you wish. Dorman then says, yep. Ross says, you understand? Oh, good. And then the court starts to get into their reasoning. As clearly exposed, they say exposed, in State's Exhibit 4A, Detective Ross inexplicably, and I would agree, this is inexplicable, he completely omitted the third and variable Miranda warning he has the right to the presence of an attorney with you during questioning. He left that out. <clears throat> Clearly not on purpose. Accidental. I right. don't think he was trying to trick him. But when something like this happens, we absolutely have to protect the rights of the worst kind of people like Chad Doerman. Or if we don't, then this happens and a whole ass confession gets thrown out. And now you don't have that. So now the jury's going to come in and they didn't hear about this case. And guess what? They don't know that he actually confessed and he talked about it. And they might not even see the video. I don't know what's going to be omitted, what's not. I have no idea. None of us do until court gets there. But this is justice. This is justice, everybody. And it's rough. It's rough justice. But it is what it is. Because if we don't protect the, the rights of the worst kind of people... They're not going to be protected for anybody. They're exactly. not going to pick and choose when you violate somebody's rights. We protect the constitutional rights of everybody in this country. We have to. Also, of critical importance is the detective's failure to adopt any other fully effective means to notify Doorman of this invariable right to fully advise him of, the, of his right to silence. So what does that mean? Well, he could have said, oh, and by the way, you have the right to exercise all these rights right now during questioning, including that lawyer can come and sit right next to you. Anytime we ask you a question, that lawyer that's sitting right next to you, you can ask him, should I answer this? Should we cut off the interview? You have those rights of his presence or her presence right now and throughout the whole interview. So that's not the exact perfect words. That's not what's written on the Miranda card, but that fully explains. And as they say, touches all the bases to explain what it's are. But he didn't do that. He simply embarked upon his interrogation of Doorman at 40.05.
And, you know, part of it, and we saw yesterday, was because these cops, the EMS people, everybody, the detectives, the people doing interrogation, they were very emotional about this, everybody. And we are we are all, too. I see Jackie saying that justice for these three babies, give justice that they deserve. You're absolutely right. And that's why they have to cross the T's, dot the I's, however you want to say it, dot the I's, cross the T's. They, we have to get it right, and we have to get it right in court. And one of the biggest failures that I've ever seen in the entire history of the United States is the Delphi case, everybody. It's such a botched, bad case all around. You, can, I can't say that it's the defense, and I can't say that it's the... The defense is actually doing a good job. I can't say it's the defense. I can't say it's the prosecution. I can't say it's a judge. Everybody's fucked up that case. It's just a one big fucked up case, and Abby and Libby are not getting justice, and I hope that they do, but it's a whole bunch of this type of shit, these technicalities, all that. So um, I'm passionate too. You can see this is why I like the lawyer you know, Peter Tragos. Pete, I call him Pete. Uh, Pete is just so passionate. He's a lawyer, and this is what he does. So he's real passionate about reading stuff and interpreting it for us. According to the court, they find that the detective did touch all the bases required by Miranda. And I think it means did not touch all the bases. And the detective did not advise Doerman of the full contours of each of his Miranda rights. And you're seeing Powell and Duckworth and Daly. Um, these are all different cases that they, they dove deep in, oh, in this. No. In this. Uh, the court finds the decision of Powell, compels it to answer all four questions as set forth above in the negative. In Powell, that was a typo, by the way, that he did not touch all the bases, I believe. Um, although he did not entirely omit any information. I don't know if this is YouTube or if it is StreamYard. Required. But, uh, yeah, and I want to stop for a second because I'm not just playing his videos, but Juror 13, the confession being thrown out, it may not be a big difference, but you'd be surprised at the end of the day when they get 12 jurors that don't know the case and this huge piece that we saw is missing. If they don't show that piece of evidence where he's sitting on the porch with a rifle and the three kids in the yard that were just executed and they don't show the interrogation, the interrogation said it all. You're just done. And, the, and they're trying to go for de the death penalty. So without a confession, that's another reason. They might not even get the death penalty now. So it's not that, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Maybe it's a possibility. Um, them to impart. First, the court found the Tampa police properly advised Powell. This is Powell, different case, that he had the right to talk to a lawyer before answering any questions. And while they did not advise him that he has the right to the presence of an attorney, as Miranda requires, they did use other fully effective means to advise him of this right saying you have the right to use any of these rights at any time during this interrogation. Accordingly, the court found in combination, the two warnings reasonably conveyed Powell's right, not Doerman, that he could have an attorney present. While Ross did advise him that he had the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you questions, he did not ask him or advise him equally of the right under Miranda and its progeny, as explained above, to have a lawyer present. So he said you could talk to him before, and then it may you may think as a as a just a normal lay person once i talk to them before then i have to come do this interview by myself and that's not how it is consequently the court finds that detective ross did not properly advise him of the four invariable warnings as required by miranda adopt other fully effective means or notify him of his right to remain silent fully you know what there was neighbors out there too juror 13 the neighbors saw it he ran down the street and brought his son back and brought them and lined them up and executed them. So yeah, they do have neighbors, they have the wife, they have the daughter, and probably plenty of people, but it just makes me sick that this happened because of that. So you're right, but he may not get the death penalty, which I don't know if it means anything nowadays. So let's keep watching. Okay. So that's the court's reasoning. Then we're going to get into, did he unequivocally invoke his right to counsel? Did he ask for a lawyer? Did he demand a lawyer in which they should have stopped the interview altogether and waited for a lawyer to show up? As opposed Absolutely. to just continuing asking him questions. If you guys 
that happened to you. So that'll happen that in the 39, 40 minute mark, right? Well, <laughs> as noted above, Detective Ross began questioning at 40.05. Five minutes later, Doerman states, I'll wait for a lawyer. I really don't know. There Give me is. a couple of days. I can talk to a lawyer so that way I can get nice, good answers. And Detective Ross says, I understand. So five minutes after you read Miranda, even if it's not appropriate or full Miranda rights, you read those rights and you say this, that's an unequivocal demand for counsel. This interview should have been shut down. This court had no other option but to grant this motion to suppress. And I'm sure they didn't want I to. I fully stand behind the court's decision here. As horrible as it is, as horrible as it seems, as much as we don't want these confessions to go away or the statements that he made to go away, the absolutely. court is absolutely correct. Frankly, the state should have agreed to this. This was horrible. And it sucks. But we wouldn't One, want it to happen just to us. Maybe the mess up with Miranda, maybe not enough, but in combination with this, there's really yep. no doubt to me. But let me know what you guys think if you disagree in the comments. Can't Ascertain disagree. the full context of Can't. Dorman's request for counsel. The court begins its inquiry when Dorman is being escorted from the immediate crime scene to... Uh, Deputy Rudd's cruiser. Walking along the roadway, Dorman asks Deputy Rudd to get his wallet out of his pocket. Deputy Rudd immediately says, shut up, dude. You have the right to remain silent. Effing use it. Seconds Fucking later, Dorman it. responds, yes, sir. As the body-worn camera we heard also that. have the running military time, it reflects that Dorman was escorted in Rudd's cruiser about 16.30 or about 4.30 p.m. on June 15th. So maybe that wasn't military time. Maybe it was just the recording. You think he was really drunk, everybody? They haven't released any of the documentation. So when they booked him, we saw a little bit of the booking in the last episode. So if you haven't seen this, go back to the last episode. I'll clip this onto it so you can watch that, then this. If you're on the replay crew, then you can watch the first one, and then you can come and watch this one next. But I do think that he was uh, drinking. He was an alcoholic, so... He was, if you're an alcoholic, then you drink every day. If you don't drink every day, then you get withdrawal. So I'm assuming that he probably was drunk, but I don't want to assume things. You know what assuming does? Spell it. You know what happens. So I'd like to see what his blood alcohol level and drugs, he might have been doing cocaine. He might have been doing, taking, you know, drinking alcohol. He might have had Xanax, cocaine, alcohol. Who knows what he had, but we, we don't know yet. We'll find out. We'll keep following this case. Time to above. I have to follow Deputy this Rudd case. Deputy Rudd transported Dorman uh, from the scene, I think that's supposed to be, to the sheriff's office in Batavia. It reflects that Dorman arrived at the sheriff's office approximately 1757, so about an hour and 15 minutes later. He was then escorted into the sheriff's office and into the interview room. Detective Ross. Oh boy. Yep. I'm calling Comcast. At least I'm not glitching out. I think you guys can hear me, but it's the video playing. So it's either Comcast or it is just YouTube. I don't engages know. the recording to the interview room at 551. So now we're almost an hour and a half after he was initially arrested. He enters the room shortly thereafter. For perhaps two minutes, Dorman sits alone in the interview room. He makes no statement of any nature. A deputy then enters the room and may, may, remains until Detective Ross re-enters uh, 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 at about 38 me. minutes on State's Exhibit 4A. It's confusing. 38 Not minutes or so, lawyer. Dorman was in the interview room. Neither he or the deputy guarding him asked any questions or made any spontaneous statements. So what they're trying to set up here and show is, as the court, once the dude said, you have the right to remain silent, effing use it, Doerman was silent. He wasn't just blathering. He wasn't just saying things. Even though that was not Miranda, he is trying to exercise his right to remain silent, the court said. And we did hear that. We watched that like five, four or five times last night. We watched them throw him on the ground and the cop. He tried to talk. He's like, hey, can you move my wallet? And the cop said, shut the fuck up. Use your right or something like that. Either way, he used that word. He told him to use to shut. He has the right to remain silent to fucking use it. So he didn't want him talking about his wallet or anything else. He had disdain for that man. And we all do, too. 
As noted, Detective Ross starts his questioning. Dorman requests a lawyer five minutes later. Detective Ross continued to ask, ask a number of questions, most of which were not about the events, but rather questions about prior contact between the two years past, how he's feeling at the time. Dorman would respond to some of the questions, but would remain silent after some. At one point, when Dorman was not responding to his questions, Ross asked him if he was thinking and if he was all right, and Dorman did not respond. 42-minute mark. Again, this is before he asked for a lawyer. Ross asked Dorman, why don't we do this? Why don't you tell me what's happening and what happened today? Dorman responds over the next 20 seconds or so. He responds to some additional questions posed to him. Between 43 and 44 minutes, he changes gears and asks him when he last ate, slept, if he was thirsty or hungry. Dorman would answer some of these questions and not respond to others. What happened to your family today at the 44-minute mark? He doesn't respond. 30 seconds later, 15 seconds later, somebody make you upset? Dorman responds, but it is unclear what he says. 44.40, between 44.40 and 45.06, Ross poses about five questions. Again, now specifically about the day's events. So that would mean eliciting potential incriminating statements. And over the following seconds, Dorman answers some of the questions, but not others. Finally, 45 minute mark. So yeah, you see this, what happened. He They should have stopped a long time ago when he said that. They could have actually asked him, are you sure you want a lawyer? It, otherwise, I have to stop. We've seen a lot of interrogations where that happens, right? Where they say, I want a cop. And he says, okay, dude, hey, you want a, you want, I'm not a cop. I, you want, I want a lawyer. And then the person says, the cop will say, do you sure you want a lawyer? I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And, and a lot of times the defendant will say, well, I want to still talk. And I don't need a lawyer. Let's keep talking. But he didn't do that, and they still kept going. He asks if Dorman was just saying he lost his way. Without hesitation, almost interrupting the detective, Dorman states, I'll wait for a lawyer. Again. So really, before any of the major incriminating statements or discussions happen, he's kind of remaining silent or trying to, and then requesting a lawyer. From his apprehension at the scene, his placement in the cruiser at the scene, during his transport, Dorman remained totally si silent for over one hour while in police custody. He asked no questions and did not make any statements during this time period. Then, while in the inter room, interview room for 40 minutes, before Ross began his interrogation, he asked no questions and made no statements. The court can best describe the interview process as one trying to pull teeth, basically meaning as a guy trying to remain silent. His conduct and demeanor, Sorry. Um, Dorman would at times sit in total silence and not look at Ross or answer his questions. At other times, he would hesitate for a few seconds before responding to a question. His conduct and demeanor from the time he was secured in the cruiser until he asked for counsel is that of a person either unwilling to talk to officers or exceedingly hesitant to do so. In another case that they cited, the court found that an ordinary person would understand the following question. Well, before you use it, can I have a lawyer here to unambiguously refer to having counsel present for the light test? First clause of Dorman's statements, I'll just wait for a lawyer, is not a question, but a declaration that he wants a lawyer. The court believes that an ordinary person would understand this declaration to unambigu and unambiguously refers to having counsel present. The second clause, I really don't know, could be considered ambiguous. Does it mean he really didn't know if he would hire a lawyer or didn't know if he had lost his way? The last statement from Detective Ross before the statement was made, taken in isolation, and if Dorman had stopped talking at that point, it is possible that an ordinary person might not understand the first two clauses, unambiguously referring to having a lawyer present and lead to finding that Dorman did not unequivocally invoke his right to remain counsel, but he did not stop there. He said, give me a couple of days. I can talk to a lawyer and get nice, good answers. That convinces the court that an ordinary person would understand these declarations unambiguously refer to having a lawyer present and coupled with the statement, I'll wait for a lawyer, leads this court to conclude Dorman unequivocally invoked his right to counsel. This conclusion is bolstered by Detective Ross's response to this declaration, I understand, and do you have a lawyer? Therefore, statements tossed. Then the court goes in over the next 10 pages and explains that the mental health evaluation and the medical exam in no way violated his constitutional rights. 
each were just a couple of, couple of minutes. Neither were custodial interviews because none of the. No, I'm going to stop on there for a minute because I know that my streaming is a lot better right now and my camera quality is better. Everything's better. I've got uh, this setup that's hooked right, straight up and I'm not sure why the video is skipping a little bit, but I'm going to answer Sadie's mama for a minute and talk about finding the court proceedings at the time and what you watch. Now, are you, if you can type in the comments, are you talking about... Um, are you talking about watching an interrogation? Is that what you're talking about? If so, let me know because we can certainly play the interrogation as well and see how harsh they are with him and what happens. I haven't gotten even into that yet. I just wanted to put a video out there yesterday and I saw this um, happen and I was not too happy about what was happening. So then I love the lawyer, you know, I saw him breaking it down and I had to break it down with you and listen to it. So if he, he was, um, yeah, he was talkative when he arrested too, but he sounds drunk and high. Okay. Okay. So we can, we could do that uh, right now. I'm doing a live so that I can get my new system going, get that to the six 30, but I would absolutely love to find the one when he's arrested and he does, he, his eyes are super red, his face, and he does look drunk. And that, it's when they book him, they, they put him, they walk him in and yeah, there's a whole video on that. And I, I, um, I just didn't play that because I didn't want to go that long. Blip a bit blurry. That's interesting because on mine, it's not blurry. Now, the lawyer you know looks really blurry and mine doesn't. So weird. Such a weird thing. So anyway, Carly, thank you for the feedback. And thank everybody for the feedback here because I'm going to come back on. But before I do, I'm going to check all my settings and everything like that. Um. Let's finish this, and then I'll drop off, and I'll come back on on six thirty. Yeah, interesting. I I look really clear on mine versus his, so I'm dropping his a little smaller. The questions that the mental health counselor or the nurse asked could reasonably be thought to elicit criminal responses in criminal statements or in incriminating statements. You have a lot less of an expectation of privacy in jail, and when you ask for a emergency medical care. We're not going to say, no, no, no. Do you want a lawyer? Let us read you these Miranda rights. That's not how it works. And that's not how it can work. You lose the expectation of privacy in jail. You know, if you talk to another inmate or if you talk to a guard or if you talk on the phone or if you talk to a nurse and you say things that are incriminating, they can and will be held against you. Right. So any statements made in those interviews, any confessions, any incriminating statements, those can and will be used against Dorman. So let's read the court, court's summary of its order, We're almost and then we'll it. get to two of the big questions at the end. And then Here's the order. The defendant's Miranda rights were violated because Detective Ross failed to properly and fully advise Doerman of them prior to initiating the custodial interrogation, and all statements obtained from Doerman during the custodial interrogation shall be suppressed, and the state shall not abuse any of them in their case in chief. So if he would have said, I did it, this is how I did it, this is why I did it, those can't be used. The defendant's Miranda rights were violated when the custodial inter interrogation continued after the defendant had unequivocally and unambiguously invoked his right to counsel when he told Detective Ross, I'll wait for a lawyer, I don't know, give me a couple days, I can talk to a lawyer and get a nice good answers. Therefore, irrespective of the detective's failure to fully, fully and properly advise Dorman of his Miranda rights, as immediately set forth above, all statements obtained during the custodial interview shall be suppressed and the state shall not adduce any of these statements in their case in chief. The defendant's Miranda rights were not violated due to the failure of the detectives to have him sign a written waiver. The court threw those out quick. The defendant's Miranda rights were not violated due to failure of the detectives to give him a written copy. Statements obtained by the detective as a result of the custodial interviews, irrespective of the violations of Miranda, Miranda as set forth, were none, nevertheless voluntary I love that he's going really fast like that. So either he, he's so when I'm watching it too, he's blurry. It's interesting because I can see him blurry. So I made him smaller and me bigger. But what, what are you going to do? When I get off, I'll, I'll check it out. This is a good test for the next one. And uh, we'll keep getting better here, everybody. I don't even know what happened now. Uh, all right, let's go. And we're not the product of coercive conduct by, by any detective or any deputy who had any contact with Dorman at any time after his apprehension, meaning 
He didn't abuse him. They didn't coerce him. They didn't do anything wrong, calling him a monster or whatever else. And then six, the butcher mental health interview and the Griffin exam, the medical exam were constitutionally permissible and none of the statements obtained from Dorman shall be suppressed. So what does that mean for Chad Dorman going forward? What does that mean? You think he's going to be convicted? Off, just because these statements were suppressed, just because this is a win for the defendant, does not mean that he won't still plead. Right. I hope he does. If he really wants to plead guilty, if he wants to take responsibility, if he wants to not get the death penalty potentially, then maybe he still pleads guilty if the state offers him some kind of plea deal. If not, and the offer was always death, plead guilty, get the death penalty, then... This just gives him a better shot at trial. Right. So he's probably, most defendants don't plead guilty to the death penalty. So maybe they're still going to go forward without these statements. So what does it mean? Does the state even have enough evidence? Yes, I'm the sure it does. is an overwhelming... Yes. All right, Pete. Have... I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone of you. I appreciate the uh, lawyer you know for helping me out on this one. And I always love coming to him. Now, I can't even believe we made it to 51 minutes, everybody. I was going to do a quick, like, 40-minute one or not even. I just kind of wanted to watch it and uh, go about my day and then come back on. But I appreciate every one of you. I'm going to come back. I'm going to try to fix some of the issues, see if it's my settings, whatever. But I love every one of you. Check out the first video. I'm going to clip them together so you can watch them again. I will go back on there and check out the local news station. And uh, yeah, in Columbus, I'm doing the best that I can do here. I just have got a brand new setup, directly hooked, best wire, fastest internet. But it's probably a faster one now. So I'm about to get off, call Comcast and do what I can. And uh, yeah, he might have active, he might have had been in active psychosis, everybody. He did say that he snapped or somebody said that he just snapped and it seems like he did that many many times but we're going to keep following this and if he goes to trial we're going to watch parts of trial we're going to see what happens if he pleads we're going to see what happens i'll go and try to find the local news station and we will do that um we will watch that and i'll I keep adding to my chad doerman playlist and we're not going to be done with this until the justice is served because we already know that he's going to be found guilty I think the answer is, is it going to be the death penalty or is it going to be life without parole? I don't think there's much other option when you line your children up and execute them like they're military style in front of a bunch of people, everybody. I really don't. I know justice can be, um, I know justice can be bad um, sometimes and they get things wrong, but I don't think they're going to get it that wrong. So Thank you. I'm going to see you guys back here in an hour and a half. I hope whatever you're doing, you can just listen to me. I have to go over some more Jen Soto stuff. And um, I'm, actually, it's Stephen Stearns that we're doing. But I'm going to throw some Jen Soto stuff in there because I can't help it. And then I want to watch the behavior panel, panel, which was the rest that I wanted to play. And that was on Stephen Stearns. Let's see how bad they um, talk about him. I cannot wait. I love you all. I hope to see you in a little bit. Thank you so much. And uh, stay for my outro. Guilty of crime. I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed my content, please share this video, like, and subscribe. You can also follow me over at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, X, or Gmail. If you'd like to donate to my channel, you can use Cash App or Venmo or PayPal. Thank you very much in advance. Guilty of crime. Are you guilty of crime?